Hello, everybody, and uh, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Um, my name is uh, Olaf Weber, and I am the chair of this first paper session, Green Finance Policy and uh, Regulators. Um, so um, welcome to everybody, and I'm uh, very delighted to, to moderate this session that has uh, three presentations. The first one is Deliberate Policy Work for Sustainable Finance, a European Commission Experiment to Tackle Grand Challenges by Stephanie Giambocaro, John Pascal Gaugh, and Celine Luce. The second paper is entitled The Effects of Mandatory ESG Disclosure Around the World by Rui Shong, Dragon Tang, Philip Kruger, and Zacharia Stoutner. And the third one is uh, entitled Financial Policy, Green Transition and Recovery After COVID-19 by Dong Yang Pan, uh, Chuan Chi Chen, Michael Grubb and Yao Wang. So um, for, for each paper, we have around, uh, around 25 minutes and um, this includes uh, questions as well. So I think you can, uh, participants can post their questions and they will be forwarded to us. And so, um, at the end, we have probably some more minutes to, uh, to discuss some, some questions and to do a question and answer period. So um, um, I propose that we start with the, with the first paper, Deliberative Policy Work for Sustainable Finance. And I think uh, the authors now can share the screen and uh, let's start the presentation. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, Excellent. Excellent. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I'm Stephanie Giamboccaro. I'm from Nottingham Business School, and I'm going to present uh, the paper, Deliberative Policy Work for Sustainable Finance, a European Commission Experiment to Tackle Grand uh, Challenges. Um, so uh, this paper, I'm, I wrote it with Jean-Pascal Gon from University of London, UK, and Céline Louche from Odensea Business School. So um, the, um, the context of our, of our paper is the creation of European Union high-level expert group on sustainable finance. So in this um, slide, you can see uh, two uh, VP commissioner from the European Commission, uh, and uh, I put some of the of the some quotes that they went with uh, uh, before launching this expert group, and you can see that they wanted to hardwire sustainability into EU financial policy, and they see that high level expert group as a way uh, to make a landmark contribution to shaping uh, European policy at the time. So, in terms of the um, to give you a bit more context, uh, this um, expert group uh, happened during uh, 2017. So there was a call for expect at, uh, at the end of 2016, uh, the group was launched. You had a series of meetings uh, that happened in 2017 and you have um, different, uh, uh, different moments uh, in this process with uh, two big moments, which were the, the launch of an interim report and the launch of a final report. And there was many things that happened uh, within this uh, high level expert group. And at the end, there was strong uh, policy outcomes since the European Commission, after uh, launching this high level expert group and making them work, uh, launched a sustainable finance action plan in uh, March uh, 2018. Uh, which was followed by a very important uh, legislative proposal on sustainable finance. And you had the launch of a technical expert group. And since that moment, uh, Europe, the European Union and European Commission took the lead and was, it became very proactive in terms of uh, ingraining sustainability uh, within uh, its uh, financial uh, regulation. So uh, what is our research further with that paper? So we uh, took uh, that, we realized that despite the growing leading role of policymaker in the design of impactful sustainable financial regulation and the track we are in is the, the proof of that, which, because we are discussing 
financial regulation and the role of a policymaker, actually little is known about the way in which policymaker design such regulation in practice. And policymakers are actually facing a dual challenge due to the fact that first, uh, sustainability grand challenges are actually complex and uncertain, uh, such as climate change, and they require to achieve a consensus between large demand of stakeholders with contradictory interest and distinct area of expertise. Meantime, uh, finance is usually is by nature technically complex to democratic scrutiny. Usually, financial regulators rely on financial experts, which reinforce technocratic approach to financial regulation. And uh, they usually deliver regulation focused on the search for efficiency and financial stability, rather than broad sustainability issue and uh, aspect of fairness. So basically, when you start to say we want to integrate sustainability within financial market, you get to have to face these two uh, challenges. So hence, our research question are, how do financial regulators organize policy work for sustainable finance? And the second question is, how does policy work generate deliberativeness through a sustainable finance regulatory process? So before getting into the detail of our research method and our research findings, I want to give you quickly uh, some definition and theoretical perspective. So we come from the organization and management uh, discipline. And so we use theories uh, coming from that field to observe our empirical phenomenon. So we use notably the, the concept and the theory uh, around institutional work, uh, which for us in this paper, we, um, we define as policy work. And uh, to, uh, for you to follow the paper, when we say institutional work, we mean the purposive actions of individuals aimed at creating, maintaining, and disrupting institutions. So we use that, uh, that theoretical background, and we also use uh, deliberative um, democracy literature, and because we are interested to understand how within this group people communicate. And so we use that concept of deliberation, which refers to the mutual communication that involves weighing and reflecting on preference, values, and interests regarding matters of common concern, which we talk from Beijing and Hour. And so basically, uh, we are really interested to understand how people communicate within the group. And we want to start peering into the black box and observe the actual dynamics of deliberation that happen within this group. And we use that idea of deliber deliberativeness uh, that uh, these two research uh, uh, introduced, Beshtiker and Parkinson, which is the overall de deliberative quality of a system, which is multifaced, uh, which is a multifaced quality that encompasses the inclusiveness of diverse perspective, which is very important in, uh, for deliberation, and but can be also evaluated in the light of the, its epistemic, what is discussed, and transformative goal, what do you want to change within uh, a specific topic? So that's our um, theoretical background. So now we'll move to our qualitative data collection. So we are doing qualitative data collection for this paper, which means that we interviewed 32 actors of that uh, high level expert group, the members of the group, including observer, commission official, supporting staff, and uh, so we have all that uh, qualitative material. We have also uh, collected a huge amount of secondary data, newspaper article, um, and um, other documents uh, that uh, we, we looked and analyzed. And we also did a bit of participative observation. So um, we, in terms of analysis, we built a chronology of case stage. Uh, we did an a round of interview open coding, uh, and we went back and forth between the literature and the, um, and, the, um, and the data. We had an in-depth biographic analysis of a LinkedIn CV, uh, and uh, we did also uh, analysis of, um, of other documents uh, that helped us to triangulate our data and our results. So we uh, we find five different types of policy work uh, and whose combination generate two mechanisms which are conducive to shape the deliberativeness of the observed sustainable finance regulatory process. 
So these uh, five types of policy work are positioning, casting, protecting collective will formation, empowering epistemic community building, and promoting uh, public outreach. So basically, we came up with this um, with this uh, type of policy work uh, by uh, looking uh, in details to our data, which we were able to inductively uh, find this uh, type of policy work, and uh, that was um, based on the very uh, detailed analysis of the quotes uh, of our interviews and snippets of uh, our secondary data. Uh, so that, uh, that was our first uh, research funding, uh, this uh, five type of um, policy work. Uh, secondly, so here you can see our um, uh, temporal bracketing because there was a phase one and phase two of that process. And uh, so we had to design the stage for the, so there was a phase where they were designing the stage for the regulatory process. And they also uh, were conducting the regulatory process in phase two. And so in first phase, it was about positioning and uh, casting. And in phase two, it was about protecting collective good formation, promoting public outreach, and empowering epistemic community building. Mm -hmm. And so this in the and the, the combination over time of positioning protecting and collective will formation brought a mechanism of responsibilizing and uh, on the on the second second level casting promoting public outreach and empowering epistemic community building brought uh, the mechanism of hybridizing so this uh, adds, has uh, some specific outcomes such as uh, the fact that not only the means of sustainability uh, of sustainable finance regulation uh, were debated, but the ends of it, uh, they were managing to have on-time delivery of the expected policy outcome from that were expecting from the European Commission, and these policy outcomes were collectively supported by all the members of the group. Nobody say I don't agree with what we put in the report. Uh, and so that was happening. So now I will get into a bit of details uh, into this um, mechanism that were uh, the combination of this different type of policy work. So hybridizing uh, was the fact that through, uh, through that process, a, a group of civil society organization sustainable finance advocates and more commercial profile were put, were brought together. And this enhanced the inclusive, transformative, and epistemic quality of the regulatory process. Also, the policymaker could not perfectly fulfill deliberative ideals of inclusiveness. Like, for example, there was more men than women. There were maybe more financial people than NGO, uh, but they were trying to achieve inclusiveness. And uh, these uh, civil society members and, uh, some, and some sustainable finance advocate we're actually confronting conventional financial profile on the negative impact of financial cap capitalism and the need for financial regulation to be more progressive. They were arguing for a more transformative view of sustainable finance, encompassing issues really related to climate justice and human rights. Also, if uh, over the process, because of that hybridizing mechanism, uh, a more classical view about climate finance, green finance, uh, one at the end in the final report. Uh, and this uh, diverse view and complementary knowledge, people were coming from different parts of the financial world and from uh, NGOs. Uh, so there was that writing process where they had to write together and they had to agree. And they managed to go through that process of collective writing and uh, collectively endorse what was put on the paper. And also at the same time, you had commercial finance profile, which at the beginning didn't know much about sustainable finance, which became sustainable finance champion in their respective countries. And after the Schleich continues to do a lot of work for a sustainable finance regulation. Uh, we had also uh, the, the responsabilizing responsibility, mechanism. Uh, which uh, called for expert responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the common good inherent to the search for sustainability-focused financial regulation. So from the beginning, the 
European Commission position an ambitious transformative agenda uh, by backing up politically the Schleg SM group. Uh, so, for example, there was two uh, vice president of the European Commission which were backing the, uh, the group, so it was quite an important thing. And so the expert understood that even if they didn't agree with each other on everything, uh, there was an episode which was the green supportive factor, which was quite uh, uh, quite um, quite intense between the members of the group. Um, they did manage to reach a collective epistemic outcomes uh, because they understood that finally this report, these two reports, could really make a difference uh, at the European Union level. And the fact that they didn't only leave, leave the expert to be in a room and write a report, but on the contrary, pushed them to be in the media, writing opinion piece, uh, be, be, being speakers uh, in a public important space. Uh, it's also make them responsible for the whole process. And it, the most critical ones, which are often the one where more into uh, speaking publicly, find themselves attached to that, uh, to that process and more or less inclined to, key, to criticize and to leave the process. And that was important to keep a collective uh, uh, consensus for that uh, very important first big move of the EU uh, financial regulation towards sustainable finance. So in, in terms of, now. yeah, okay, I'm wrapping up. So in terms of the theoretical contribution, we advance uh, the uh, study for uh, sustainable finance by conceptualizing how regulators organize sustainably focused policy work. Uh, we contribute to the institutional work literature by conceptualizing two mechanisms bridging different types of policy work. And we contribute to deliberative democracy studies by showing how deliberative normative ideals can be leveraged to democratize the way in which experts interact through regulatory process. Uh, finally, uh, in terms of the practical implication uh, and our boundary conditions, so by peering into the black box of the EU expert group on sustainable finance, a research finding can be leveraged by policymakers willing in different parts of the world to focus financial regulation on sustainability challenges. Uh, by adopting a qualitative um, perspective combining different theoretical streams and focusing on the regulatory process, our work suggests that financial regulator, due to the nature of sustainability challenges, could gain in being reflexive on how to bring some deliberativeness to the future sustainable finance regulatory process. So can regulator enhance their technocratic success by being inclusive and by reflecting on their future transformative and epistemic outcomes? Uh, so there are some boundary conditions to our work. So we were in the European context, uh, which has historically uh, developed a lot of sustainable finance experts, which are kind of hybrids between finance and sustainability. And we have many uh, people who are talking uh, in, uh, in this conference who are these uh, sustainable finance experts. Uh, so there is that question, are our findings uh, that we find in the European Union context can be applicable for other countries? whom financial markets and political regime can function slightly differently? Uh, or does it help to understand the uh, international financial regulatory process beyond the US scope, knowing that the EU is already a transnational exercise because it's all different countries who are talking to each other. And you have other schlegs that have been organized, for example, in Canada and Australia. And so there is the question to know could this uh, type of um, experience be uh, replicated in uh, emerging market context and how they will be organized? So thank you for your for listening. So I'm uh, happy to take questions and feedback on this work, which is uh, in progress. So we are in the process of uh, revising the summit with this paper. We are in a good uh, in a good shape for that. So yes. Yeah. So thank you so much, and uh, I'm um, looking forward to your questions. It's a lot, Stephanie, and I don't see any questions in the chat so far. But I, I have, a, if you allow, I have one. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's super interesting. So my question would be, and maybe you have some insight on that. What happens if you have conflicting views? You know, you said there's a diverse group composition, and I assume you have some people from climate change or sustainability NGOs, maybe on the, the other hand, um, 
representative from the financial industry that might have totally different views. So, so is there a certain way how these kind of conflicting views are, are dealt with and, and what, what happens with them in, in the final report then at the end? Um, yeah, so thank you, Ola, for your question. So clearly, um, and so that was a bit of a, because usually when the European Commission do financial regulation, they take financial experts and that's it. So for this one, they realized that they couldn't do that. So they really thought hardly to whom they would put in the group. And they took quite a lot of these sustainable finance experts. They mixed them with a more hardcore NGO uh, like uh, WWF. And so there was also NGOs which were more sustainable finance driven. And there was really conventional financial profile like the bank, banking uh, association from Poland type of thing. And, and the chair was really reflexive about thinking, oh, he was going to get this guy to, uh, to beat, fight each other in a way, but managing to, to get to a consensus. And a lot of the things that were organized within the group, uh, like the way he constituted the groups, the way he changed the, he changed the groups, um, the way they had to deliberate on the on different uh, different steps of the of the process. Like they on purpose, they had an interim and a final report to be able to kind of uh, uh, get each other to agree. So so what we realized it was really a reflexive thing to manage to get them to communicate, to not agree and to be able to move forward that. And also to, because system of finance is a huge thing. You know, there is different part of it, different uh, realities, and, and people are on benchmark, other are on biodiversity, and all you make them talk to each other to get to, get to write some precise recommendation that will be collectively endorsed and will be accepted also by uh, policymakers. Thank you. And probably you can use that for other topics as well. It's not only sustainable finance, as you mentioned, in other countries, but there, there are so many complex topics. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've, I kind of focus on the sustainable finance context, but we think that that could be used for other topics uh, and, and beyond financial regulation. Thank you. I don't see any other questions here. So, I think that we can continue with the next. Um, presentation by uh, Rui Zhang on uh, the effects of mandatory ESG disclosure around the world. And I think again, we can share your screen. Okay, thank you, Ola. So let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay, so first I would like to thank the program committee for including my paper in this wonderful program. Actually, I learned a lot from this conference starting from the site session. So uh, the title of this paper is uh, effect, The Effects of the Mandatory ESG Disclosure Around the World. So basically we are looking for, uh, we're just uh, examining the impacts of uh, a typical, I mean, a typical policy, the mandatory ESG uh, disclosure. This is a joint work with uh, Philip, uh, Philip uh, that a dragon uh, from the different universities. So basically, uh, in this paper, uh, first, uh, I mean, I just uh, in this conference, I do not need to explain what's a ESG. Here, I just want to highlight that. So for the ESG information, those information are all related to the non-financial information and non-structured data. So that means it's pretty hard to quantify those kind of information. When we talk about the sustainable finance or ESG, it's pretty easy to understand intuitively. But how to quantify those kind of concept? This is very difficult. And also for those data, those are non-structured data, it means we have to use some textual analysis. We have to use, I mean, we have to create some kind of quantitative measures regarding to if we want to really to mirror the ESG. That will be the difficulties in terms of uh, disclosing or uh, just communicating with the ESG information. So, you know, nowadays, uh, uh, I mean, if, uh, if we talk about sustainable finance or ESG, it seems like this becomes to be pretty hard especially related to the climate change. So for the investors, their attention to the firm's ESG performance are also pretty high. 
So that's related to the information disclosure about the ESG. As I mentioned on the previous slides, so for the ES data, the, the, I mean, most of those data uh, are non-structured uh, non, uh, uh, non data, so it's pretty hard to quantify. So that's why it will create some kind of difficulty to disclose the ESG information. So according to surveys done by the EY and the Young, they found that around 60% of the respondents basically just survey uh, the, I mean, the big financial uh, institutions. So that would be the representative investors. They believe that. So uh, around 60% of the respondents believe that the companies don't disclose the ESG risk means they don't got uh, they don't they want to get more information and also i just grab a couple of the headlines from the newspapers which also highlights the demands from the investor side so the investors just want to know more ESG information in order to incorporate the ESG i mean component into their investment decisions so that will be the facts so how to solve these problems so you can, I mean, lots, I mean, the, 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 the governments, they notice this problem. They just try to, I mean, solve this problem by mandate, by mandate uh, the firms, the listed firms or state-owned firms or different type of firms to try to disclose more ESG information. In these studies, we just collect those kind of mandatory ESG disclosure regulation from different sources. This is not an easy job. So it's pretty easy to, I mean, when we talk about the mandatory ESG disclosure, since the different countries, they have a different legal regime. They have a different situation in terms of the financial market development. And also they have the uh, different cultures. So there is no unique regulations. I mean, ESG disclosure regulations will fit in all the countries. And also for different countries, their progress for pushing the ESG disclosure is different. So for example, in some countries, they just uh, start from the voluntary disclosure and then move gradually to the mandatory ESG disclosure. So that's why we spend quite a bit effort try to collect those mandatory ESG disclosure regulation around the world. We combine a couple of sources from the GRI Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. And also uh, if we, uh, we also just try to verify those kind of information from different sources, including the government agencies, stock exchanges, newspaper, and so on. Just try to cross-check the accuracy because we just want to examine, I mean, what's the real impact of mandatory ESG disclosure across the different countries. So here, this is will be some sample regulations we collected. So in our, I mean, in our data set about the mandatory ESG disclosure regulations, so we just collect the, the, the years in, in which, uh, I, mean, the diff, I mean, the authority forced the firm to disclose the ESG information. And also the uh, disclosure venue. Since uh, in a different country, as I mentioned, they are facing a different situation. So that's why here we can see a big heterogeneity across the different countries in terms of, I mean, about the mandatory ESG disclosure policies, uh, in terms of the disclosure venue, the regulations, authorities, and very interesting for last column, that will be the comply or experience. This happened to some countries, in some countries. So they will just uh, ask the firm to explain and if the firm, I mean, does not follow the mandatory disclosure. So for this kind of case, we also consider it's a mandatory disclosure because the firm, I mean, in their explanations to the uh, uh, authority about uh, why they don't disclose ESG information, it will show some information at least to the investor, to public. So that's why we consider all of those regulations as the mandatory ESG disclosure regulation and use in our studies. So according to our, uh, I mean, according to our data set, so by 2017, we have uh, we we just uh, we just collected twenty five out of fifty two sample countries that required some form of man of mandatory di uh, disclosure of ESG uh, information. So if we just look at nowadays, maybe the number of countries would be much bigger. But our data set stops in two thousand seventeen. So here, this will be the geographical di uh, distribution of the mandatory ESG disclosure regulations. Uh, regula uh, so this use a diff uh, different colors to represent the different years in which uh, they start to force the firm to disclose ESG information. So that will be the regulation. Now we just ask three key research questions. The first one is, what's the country level determinants for the mandatory ESG disclosure? You know, the adoption of mandatory ESG disclosure regulation is not a random event. 
Okay, there must be some reasons. The government or the uh, or the uh, uh, authority just try to use those kind of policy to to reach certain goals. For example, maybe satisfy the the demands of the from the investor about the ESG information. Maybe other kind of goals. So this is the first question. The second question is what's the real effect of monetary ESG disclosure on the ESG report? You know, intuitively. If we, if the government ask the firm to disclose yet information, the major venue would be the sustainability report or maybe the annual report. So, what's the real impact? This is the immediate. Uh, this is the. Uh, this is would be an uh, immediate uh, uh, impact. And if we just uh, go deeper, since after the disclosing, after disclosing the yet information, this will re this will enrich. The informational environment. So, what's the real impacts of monetary ESG disclosure on the ESG informational environment? We look at, we try to measure the informational environment from the different angles, starting from the financial analyst. In particular, we look at the accuracy and dispersion of the analyst forecast, and we also look at some public media. We collect the, some ESG incidents from the public news. So it's the, I mean, that's uh, uh, the monetary year disclosure affects the ESG incidents collected or released in the public media. And lastly, we we'll just look at the equity market. We focus on stock price uh, 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 crash because the stock price uh, crash risk used uh, as a, it's a proxy for negative information hardening. So we just try to examine the real impacts on monetary ESG disclosure on the information environment from those three aspects, okay? So based on those three research questions, we just uh, con construct four hypotheses. The first one is just uh, re uh, related to the ESG, the number of the ESG reports. And the second one related to the financial analyst forecast, the accuracy and the dispersion. The third one related to the public media news regarding to negative ESG news, okay? The last one is related to the equity market, the fluctuation or the risk or stability of the financial market proxied by the stock price crash risk, okay? So then we just uh, collect the data from the different sources. Uh, for example, we got the ESG report from GRI and asset 4. So we combine them together, try to maximize the size of samples to cover as many as possible firms. Okay? And then we just collect the analyst forecast information from IBAS, the ESG instance from rep risk. And for stock price crash risk, we got all the information from Tom's uh, Reuters, try to measure the stability of the financial market. So first, What's the determinant for the monetary ESG disclosure? Here we just list a couple of the institutional characteristics in our regressions. So here I just want to highlight two most important ones. The first one is just regarding to legal origin. According to our study, we find that in the common law, in the common law countries, the adoption of monetary ESG disclosure will be higher. Okay, so this is consistent with the Leon and Rinderberg findings because uh, in a common law country, usually the EIG performance will be relatively lower compared to the uh, compared to the civil law uh, countries. So maybe uh, the government try to fill those kind of regulation wise. So that's why it reduced the adopt the mandatory ESG disclosure. And the second factor I, will, I want to highlight here is about the emission. Here we just look at the carbon emission. So if the, for the countries who had a higher level of carbon emission, the probability to enforce the mandatory ESG uh, ESG disclosure will be higher. So that means maybe the country, I mean, the government just try to use the mandatory ESG disclosure to solve or to mitigate the, the, aging, the, the climate change risk and to reduce the carbon emission, okay? And then we just look at how the immediate impacts on the numbers, the availability of ESG report, and also the quality of the ESG report. Before conducting the multivariate regression, I just show some figures about our univariate analysis. Here, the shaded bar would be the after the monetary ESG disclosure across, I mean, uh, across the different countries. And uh, the white one would be before. Here we can see that across all the countries, so we can see a clear, I mean, uh, increasing trend about the availability of ESG report. Now, if we look at the quality of the ESG re report, uh, specifically, we just uh, use uh, the, the compliance with the GRI standards. So that means 
in our data set for each uh, sustainability report. So there is one indicator. So to indicate whether it comply with the GRI standard or not. If it is, so we just consider it has a, it, uh, it as a high quality uh, report. Otherwise, it will be zero. Here we found that after the mandatory ESG disclosure, it seems like the percentage of the reports that comply with the GRI standards increase significantly. This is just a univariate analysis. Now we just run the multivariate regression and to con after controlling lots of determinants, including the firm level characteristics, the market level, industry level, and the year fixed effect. Here, this is more of the findings related to the impacts on ESG report. Basically, what we found that after the adoption of mandatory ESG disclosure regulations, the availability of the ESG report increased dramatically. Okay, here we can see the significant positive coefficient. So that means, okay, so it works. So after the mandatory disclosure, we do see more reports. But regarding to the quality, so as I mentioned before, we use the compliance with the GRI to proxy for the quality of the report. Unfortunately, we didn't find the significant coefficient. So that means, statistically speaking, we didn't find a significant impact on the quality of the yes, report in general across the whole samples. So maybe it's a big, I mean, there's some kind of heterogeneity across a country, across a firms, because the different firm have a different motivation to disclose yet information. So that's why we used to conduct some kind of firm level heterogeneity analysis. So basically, first we look at availability of yet report. We look at the size, institutional ownership, and also ESG performance measured by certain analytic scores and asset for ESG scores. We found that for the small firms, it's uh, I mean the impacts on the availability of ESG report will be uh, will, will be stronger. So that means this is also very intuitive. So that means for the small firm, for the big firm, you already they already have the ESG report. But for the small firm, before the mandatory disclosure, maybe they don't have the ESG report. After the implementation of these regulations, the small firms start to issue the ESG uh, report. So that's why it had more pronounced impacts. Well, for the ESG ratings, so for the firm with high ESG rating, you already they have the ESG report. Well, for low rated firms, maybe they don't have it. So that's why the impacts of mandatory disclosure on the availability of ESG report will be more pronounced for the firm with a, with a small size and a higher and lower ESG score. Now, just, just look at the firm level heterogeneity across the, about the, the quality of ESG report. So here we found that the impacts of the mandatory disclosure on the quality of report will be more pronounced for large firms. As I mentioned before, for large firms, maybe they have already have the report, okay? After implementing of the mandatory disclosure policies, small firms start to issue the sustainability report. For the big firms, if they want to distinguish themselves from the, I mean, from the rest of firm, they have to increase the quality of the report. So that's why we document a more pronounced impact on large firms regarding to the quality improvement after the mandatory disclosure. Okay. So and also for the for the for the ESG scores, we find that it will be more pronounced for the firms with a lower ESG score, which is consistent with the quality. That's regarding that will be the real impacts on the ESG report. Now let's just look at the deeper about the actual information environment, starting from analyst behavior. For the financial analysts, their job is just try to collect the information, including the financial information and non-financial information. So after mandatory disclosure policies, for the financial analyst, they should be able to access more information. So more information definitely, I mean, intuitively, will improve their accuracy, their forecast accuracy, and also reduce the dispersions across the different financial analysts. So that's exactly what we found, okay? According to our data, we, found, we find that the analyst forecast accuracy increased and the dispersion decreased after the uh, implementation of mandatory ESG disclosure. So from this view of point, the ESG disclosure policies will improve the informational environment, okay? Then we just look at minutes. how, okay, thank you. So the, uh, uh, then we just look at how it affects the, the ESG incidents released in the public media. 
So we just collect some uh, ERD, uh, incidents reported by the media from the ref risk. So we look at the number of the news and the normal the, the novelty of the news means whether this is the new news or this is old news regarding to some ESG instance. And the third column will look at the influence. Okay, so whether this is a very big event reported by the very, uh, very influential media. So basically what we found is after adopting our monetary ESG disclosure policies, so the number of the ESG incidents and the novelty and even the inf influence decreased. So this is, uh, I mean, this, uh, this tells us that, I mean, it suggests that the adoption of monetary ESG disclosure may be just a uh, force have some have sort of disciplining impacts on the managers and to reduce its uh, some kind of uh, misconducts on the ELD events. So that's why we just uh, find less uh, report from the public media. The alternative, the, uh, the alternative interpretation of these findings is maybe after the mandatory disclosure policies, the firm would rather to disclose all the information from the, I mean, using the sustainability report or maybe using their annual report. So that, that's why we just uh, uh, find the, uh, I mean, a lower likelihood or lower number of the media news regarding to the negative ESG events. So lastly, we we'll just look at how it affects the stability of the financial market. So by looking at the real effects on the stock price crash risk. For the stock price crash risk, actually it focuses on the two sides of the stock return distributions. There are, there are lots of literature trying to examine uh, I mean the, I mean the, uh, the, the driver for the stock price crash risk. The most prevailing story is just about the negative information hardening. So that means for the firm, they have the they have tendency for the manager, they have motivation to withhold the bad news and release the good news, but they cannot withhold those kind of bad news forever. So once the, those kind of withhold the bad news reach a tipping point, it will release to the market all the way. So that results in a crash in the stock price, okay? So here we find that after adoption of monetary ESG disclosure, so the stock price crash risk significantly declines. So that means the adoption of monetary ESG disclosure will facilitate the negative information flow, at least the negative ESG information flow to the market. So that's why it will reduce the likelihood of stock price crash risk, okay? So that'll be the, all the empirical findings uh, of our paper. Now, let me just do a very quick, quick summary. So in this stories, we just uh, examine the real effects of monetary ESG disclosure on the, I mean, on the firm's ESG reporting and informational environment. Basically, we find a very positive result. So that means after adoption of monetary ESG uh, disclosure policies, we find availability of report increase. And we find that, uh, we find that the informational environment is significantly improved. I find the lower, uh, I mean, the higher act analyst forecast accuracy, lower dispersion, and also it will just uh, make the financial market to be more stabilized in terms of the lower stock price crash risk. Okay, so that's all for my presentation. Thanks very much for your attention. So welcome for the comments and um, suggestions. Thanks a lot, Thank you. Rui. So um, we have a question here and um... Uh, someone asked, have you considered doing some textual analysis based on these CSR reports to better measure the quality of disclosure rather than only looking at the basic characteristics of the CSR reports itself? Yeah, that's a very good question. This is very challenging work. Actually, we tried before. Uh, so uh, according to the GRI data set, so we can got all the, I mean, for the firms, they will upload their sustainability report and also annual report on server. So we just download all those sustainability report and annual report and try to do some textual analysis. There are a couple of practical difficulties. Uh, first of all, if we just uh, analyze, do the textual analysis across those reports, different countries, they use a different language. Okay, so this is one of the difficulty. And the second one is some of the reports are integrated in the annual report. So, I mean, it's pretty hard to, uh, to handle those kind of non-structured data. So basically we have a trial. What we did is we just uh, look at the language and also the length of the report, the type of the report, just, uh, just use several, I mean, very simple proxies to mirror 
the quality. But eventually we didn't incorporate those results into our, I mean, into our paper because let's say if we have a longer report, longer report, that means this is good. And if we have, I mean, uh, some kind of keywords that's related to sustainability, so it's pretty hard to justify it's good or not. So that's why eventually we just adopt the merits or the indicator, whether it's comply with GRI standards, because we believe that GRI standards might be a good, free, uh, I mean, a better framework to report or disclose yet information. So that's why we just, uh, actually we did some work using textual analysis, but eventually we didn't incorporate into our re results because uh, it cannot hard to justify the good or bad using textual analysis. So, but thanks very much for your comments. This is a, a very, very, uh, this is a very good point. We have another question um, on, on social norms towards ESG. So the question here is whether you have also considered social norms toward ESG in terms of country level determinants of mandatory mm -hmm. disclosure. So there might be countries that have higher or lower social norms and there might, they, these norms might play a role as well. Yep, yep. Very good point. So uh, we didn't incorporate. So maybe in the next version, we'll just try it. Thanks very much for this point. It's well taken. Thank you. So there's no question here, but you know, I, I, I wonder um, with, with your test, did you control for, ju for just the time effect? You know, we see more disclosure anyway over time, probably also in countries that don't have mandatory, so mandatory effects. So did you control for that or can you? Uh, can actually, you, yeah, say I something did, about that. Yeah, we do control the year fixed effects, but it's uh, 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 I mean, but it's a very interesting point regarding the difference between the voluntary and mandatory. As I mentioned at the beginning, so some countries they just uh, starting from the voluntary disclosure, it's more like the transition to the mandatory because if they just start the mandatory disclosure, maybe the firms will complain. So they will start from the voluntary and then gradually, so they will translate to the mandatory. So it's more like it's not a one-time shock. So this is also make our, our startup very challenging. So it's, um, uh, it's more like uh, there are lots of, it's just related to the first question about the determinants of the mandatory disclosure because this is not a random events. So there are lots of reasons. And maybe we can incorporate the voluntary disclosure because some countries they use uh, they use uh, some uh, I mean uh, the longer time period for the voluntary and then switch to the mandatory. And also we find some interesting case, for example, in Australia. So they use the mandatory disclosure, then they reverse back and they cancel this, this, this kind of policy. So that's why in a different country, they have a different situation. Maybe they have different concerns. Because we know that in Australia, it's very different. It's uh, also, it's not a high carbon emission country, but it's just, uh, it's produced uh, lots of coals. So which, which will maybe, I mean, if they, man, if they just uh, force the firm to disclose those kind of information, the BHB or uh, Rio Tinto, they won't be happy. So the, the, there are also some kind of political issues regarding to the enforcement of those kind of policy. Yeah, so for the time, it's, uh, maybe the year fixed effect is not enough, but uh, uh, maybe let, I, uh, yeah. that, that's what we have in this version. But your sure. point is pretty good. So we will just uh, think about that. Thank you. Might also think about using the, the uh, uh, emissions per capita. Then Australia is pretty high yep. compared to other countries <laughs> or Canada as well. So, so that might be yeah. something else. So I have a final question here and from the from the from the participants. Do you think that the quality of ESG reporting uh, differs between country classifications by income level? So do we have higher income, better quality, or, or lower? Mm -hmm. than any, yep. any kind of it? Um, guess yeah, yeah. Level, I guess. Evidence. Yeah, so that's a very good point. So we will just uh, do some analysis regarding to this. Some uh, just uh, look at the different, uh, the high income, low income. Just look at uh, heterogeneity across the countries. Thank you. Okay, very interesting. Thanks a lot for the for this interesting uh, presentation. Yeah, we have ten twenty, so we can continue with the uh, the next presentation by Dong Yang Pan as the first author, financial policy, green transition, and recovery after the after COVID-19, so a topic that everybody is super interested in. So um, 
it's your floor. Okay, thank you, Olaf. And thank you everyone for attending today's meeting. Uh, so the presentation, stop the video. So hello everyone, my name is Dong Yang Pan and the title of the research today is Financial Policy, Green Transition and the Recovery of the COVID-19 Crisis. So I just graduated from University College London and now I just started my job at Renmin University of China. And the cause includes Chen Chen and our uh, supervisors, Professor Michael Graff and uh, Professor Yao Wang. So this is a theoretical research. So maybe I don't have time to introduce every part of this, this, this paper. Uh, and today I will mainly focus on the first two part of this research. First, it's the introduction. Before I really start, I may want to introduce four definitions that have been used in this research. First, what is financial policy? Financial policy are those policies that act on financing activities, including those conducted solely by financial regulators and also those carried out jointly with other regulators, such as the fiscal subsidy. Second, what is green financial policy? It means those financial policies that aim to alleviate the barriers to and increase the incentives for green investment. Third, green transition. It means the change of economic and the industrial structure, the share of the green sector increase and the non-green sector decreases. Lastly, green recovery. It means an economic recovery that consists of green transition after the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, let me really start my introduction of this research. Uh, first, the background. I think most of us today here knows that in the practice, it is the emergence of a green financial policy, such as in China. The country is, is trying to establish a green financial system. It tries to incentivize and facilitate green finance by various uh, pu public policies, such as the interest or green law. And also in the Europe and the United Kingdom, their, their central banks are trying different ways, such as climate-related stress testing to, uh, face, to, to combat the climate change. And also now there is a, a international body called NGFS, Network for Greening the Financial System. Uh, there are near a hundred central banks around the world. They are trying to carry out different kinds of green financial policies. Another background, uh, uh, I think, of course, you will know, uh, you already know that that is the call for green recovery and it's a commitment for net zero. Uh, in the near two years, uh, most, uh, econ most uh, major economies in the world has committed the net zero target and they also committed to finance for the so-called green recovery. Okay, given the above background, we can anticipate that more green financial policy will be carried out in the near future. But before they are carried out, we may need to first answer a very fundamental question. That is why we need the so-called green financial policy. And what is the relationship between green financial policy and the green transition of the physical economy, which is the ultimate purpose of, the, of such policy? To answer this general question, I have five sub specific questions in this research. First, if and how do financial factors affect the green transition? Second, what can financial policy do for the transition? Third, how the policy takes effect? First, which, which is more important? That is, given the current pandemic, what can the policy do for the so-called green recovery? And lastly, how should we implement such policy? So to answer these questions, we have built a microeconomic growth model. And this model is based on a paper by Isma Galu, uh, which was published in American Economic Review in 2012. Uh, in that paper, 
they find that technology investment and the innovation of clean industry is crucial for green economic transition. And also another paper by Chu and Toth. This paper, in this paper, they find that financial constraint on the research and the design investment could influence economic growth. So we have built a growth model that includes first directed technical change. This will allow us to divide the growth of the green and the non-green sector. And we also include the financial constraint and the financial policy to alleviate such constraint. So the so-called green financial policy can be introduced into our model. By using this model, we have done three things. First, we showed the specific roles of financial policy in supporting the green transition by giving and proving four propositions. And then we numerically compare the effect of green financial policy with uh, other green economic policies, and we try to find how different policies can be better coordinated. Lastly, we conduct a, a dynamic simulation of policy implementation uh, under and uh, with and without the COVID-19 shock under different uh, uh, policy settings. Uh, the potential contribution of this uh, research includes three parts. First, it could be the first research to study the role of financial policy in the green transition and recovery of the, of the economy. And second, this paper extended the so-called directed technical change growth model with financial features. And we also integrate fin green financial policy into a theoretical model. And also this paper can help policymaking by providing some new information to policymakers. So that's a very short introduction. And uh, maybe I will spend more time to introduce my growth model, which can be used for uh, analyzing the so-called green financial policy. So as mentioned above, this model is based on Ismoglu 2012. And in this model, uh, we have introduced the endogenous technical change by assuming the research and design need on the machine sector. We also, uh, you can see in this graph, uh, we have household machine producer, intermediate good producer, and also final good producer. This is a very traditional framework of uh, uh, general equilibrium. And uh, what, we what we newly introduced is the so-called uh, directed technical change. We have divided uh, uh, the machine producer and the intermediate good producer into two parts. One is the green part, another is the non-green part. This will help us introduce the so-called directed technical change. And also we introduce some financial features in this model. We assume that the machine producer will need money from the household in production. And uh, it, the money is borrowed from the household by law. After the production, they will pay back the interest and the profit to the household. Also, we introduce four, kind of, four kinds of policies that includes financial policy, which can be regarded as interest subsidy. Uh, the government and the financial, financial regulator will provide the financial policy to the machine producer. And we also introduce innovation subsidy, machine subsidy, and the intermediate good subsidy. These subsidies are all provided to uh, the producers, these two producers. In addition, we introduce the environmental and the pandemic features. How we introduce the pandemic shock, we assume that the labor will be affected by the pandemic, their utility will be affected by the pandemic shock. And the utility includes the utility of ordinary labor and the utility of scientists. We also introduce the natural environment. We assume that the non-green non -green firms will have emission which could pollute, pollute the natural environment and the environment will in turn affect the utility of household. So this is the framework of the new model. 
And let's then let's see some equations for the modeling work. One of the key equations is the production function of the intermediate good form. We assume that the production of the intermediate good form will need machine, technology, and labor. And all these input, input factors are divided into two parts, the green part and the non-green part. This is the output of intermediate good form. It includes the green output and the non-green output. We assume that only the non-green subsector will emit greenhouse gases, and the emission will be proportional to the production of the non-green sector. And also, the greenhouse gases will accumulate in the atmosphere. OK, let's see how we introduce the so-called directed technical change. We assume that there are two kinds of technologies. One is the clean technology, another is the non-clean technology. The growth of the technology will depend on some on two parameters. This and this are parameters. And S is the key determinant of the technology growth. This is the number of scientists that work for this technology. SG means the scientist, the number of scientists that work for the green technology. And this is the number of scientists that work for the non-green technology. We normalize the total number of scientists to one. So according to this technology growth equation, we can find that the more scientists are in one sector, the faster its technology will grow. And this will also crowd out the number of scientists that work for the other one. This is what we call the directed technical change. And we can also find that the sectoral distribution of scientists will finally determine the direction of the growth of the economy. Direction means towards green or non-green. OK, that's the so-called directed technical change. And uh, let's see how we introduce uh, the financial features. First, we introduce financial constraint. We assume that part of the cost, uh, this is the utility, uh, this is the objective function of the machine producer. This is the selling price. This is the cost. This is the uh, total number of machines. So, this part is the original profit of a machine producer, and its objective is to maximize the profit. But we assume that part of the cost will need to be financed. Here is the additional financial cost. So in this equation, B means the amount of loan a machine producer needs to get or borrow from the household so that to facilitate the production process and it should not be lower than a certain share of the total cost. This, this is what we mean the financial constraint. And the financial constraint will cause the financial cost. Omega will reflect the uh, stringency of financial constraint. And after the simplification, we can find that I multiplied by B is the total financial cost both multiplied by the constraint and I is the interest cost. Uh, interest rate. We we'll assume that financial policy can help alleviate the financial constraint. That means it can lower in the omega or directly subsidize the interest cost it can, or lower in the i. We define as the strength of financial policy. And after the simplification, we can find that this is the total financial cost of a machine producer after a financial policy. OK, that's a very brief introduction of the model. And by using this model, I have done three analyses. The first, I studied the role of financial policy in the green transition. Uh, this, is, this is by some formal proofs and uh, propositions and proofs. We find that financial policy can play an active role in supporting the green transition, which includes increase the technology and the production of the green sector. 
Second, it can bring about a so-called automatic green transition. Automatic here means the economy can green, uh, the economy can grow towards green automatically without any policy intervention. Also, the financial policy or green financial policy can prevent the potential environmental disaster. These are shown by four propositions that it, uh, uh, oh, okay, I will be very quick uh, to, just to show what I've done based on this model. These are the uh, five or uh, four propositions based on the model, but due to the time li limit, I may not have time to introduce how I proved it. If you'd like to have a look, you can download my paper and I will show you the link at the end of this uh, presentation. Then I use this model to, uh, to do some uh, simulation work. To help the green transition, actually a wide range of policies with different advantages and disadvantages can be chosen. Together with the green financial policy, they constitute the toolkit of government and the financial regulators. In this part, we numerically compare the effect of green financial policy with other green economic policies and try to find how different policies can be better coordinated. This is the result of the policy comparison. The x-axis is the uh, policy cost and the y-axis is the production. This is the production of the green sector and this is the production of the non-green sector. We can find that under different policies, different lines uh, with different uh, of policy, uh, the Growth, uh, the green sector output and the non-green sector output will grow very differently. And we can find that the financial policy will play the largest role. And then we also try to compare the uh, coordination or the mix of the different policies, the mix of uh, uh, innovation subsidy with other uh, three other policies. We can still find that when the financial policy is mixed with innovation subsidy, the effect will be the largest. Uh, I will introduce the findings at the end of this presentation. Uh, now I go directly to the fifth part of this research. This is a dynamic simulation and the, uh, the so-called green recovery. In this part, we simulated the development of the economy under different policy scenarios and invest, investigate the so-called green recovery of the COVID-19. To do this, we first need to extend the basic model with the COVID-19 shock. This is by introducing the disutility on labor participation. In this part, we have done two simulations. One is the simulation of the economy without any shock under different policy settings. This will show how different policies can bring to the economy and the green transition in normal times. And then we simulate the economy with the COVID-19 shock under different policy settings. This will show the impact both by the pandemic and the so-called green recovery that is facilitated by policies. Uh, this is how we, intro how we extend the model. We assume that the utility will be uh, affected by the uh, labor participation. And when the pandemic comes, there will be a coefficient that uh, bring more disutility to the labor and the scientist. This is the disutility brought by the pandemic. And we assume that the uh, pandemic disutility coefficient is an autoregression process. As an extended model, this is the result, simulation result without the shock. We can find that with different policy scenarios, the economy will grow differently. This is the uh, output of the green sector, and this is the output of the non-green sector, and this is the uh, greenhouse gas uh, stock. We can find that with all three policies together, the uh, economy will go green very fast. 
And this is the result with the pandemic shock. Um, we also simulated different policy scenarios. And I will introduce the findings at the end of this presentation. So now it goes to the end of this presentation, the conclusions. First set of conclusions is about the financial constraint and the financial policy itself. We find that financial constraint is non-trivial in the economy and the sectoral asymmetric uh, financial constraint could delay the green transition if no additional policy is introduced. A green financial policy can increase the production of the green subsector temporarily. And if the gap between the green and non-green technology is not wide, green financial policy can bring a permanent change in technology and the production by itself and facilitate an automatic green transition and help prevent the potential environmental disaster. As a simulation of policy, compa of policy comparison and coordination, we find that the financial policy can bring effects similar to what the traditional economic policies can do in supporting the green transition. And compared with the traditional policies, the financial policies has some certain advantages and disadvantages. And it can be coordinated with innovation subsidy and other policies to save cost and improve policy effectiveness. Lastly, as a dynamic simulation, we find that the mix and the coordination of green financial policy and other policies can actually accelerate the green transition to a large degree. And the COVID-19 shock will delay the green transition, but the transition will still be realized with continuous green economic policies during the pandemic. And lastly, a moderately strengthened green financial policy is desirable since it can bring forward the peaking year of the emission and the green transition, or we call it, it can bring a greener recovery without compromising the uh, policy cost. So that's my presentation. If you want to know the full techn technology details, you can download the paper from SSRN uh, by this link. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dong Yang. And um, I have a question here in, in the panel. Um, the question is, uh, were you able to distinguish between government financial investment in green research and development and the, the privately funded investments? If so, which of you do you think would be more effective and enable easier adaptation? Uh, yeah, actually in this paper, I didn't introduce the government finance. I only introduced the private finance from the household. So in this model, it, uh, this model cannot uh, help analyze the effect of government finance. It's only for private, ana private finance analyze. So. Thank you. I have a question. Did you also compare the effect of green policies with non-green policies for a COVID recovery? Uh, yeah, actually that can be done by this model, but in this model, you can see from the uh, scenarios, my simulations, I've already introduced many other policies. So uh, it's not very easy to put in one graph, uh, also put it the uh, non-green uh, policies. But I can anticipate the uh, result of non-green sector uh, of non-green policy, it will be very symmetrical to the green sector, just to change the place of Y, G, and Y, N. That will be the result of the uh, non-green uh, policies. Yeah. Would be also interesting probably which type of green policies and non-green policies have, have a stronger uh, effect and explaining that as one. Well. Yeah, actually in this, in this research, I find that uh, uh, in the static comparison, we find that uh, this is something interesting, some interesting result. That is the financial policy actually is stronger than many other traditional policies. But the, there is a disadvantage of financial policy. That is the financial subsidy cannot be higher than 100% of the uh, of the uh, interest cost. 
So it means the effect of the financial policy has a ceiling. So when the when the strength of financial policy reach a hundred percent of the interest uh, uh, required, the total effect of the financial policy is uh, highest. It cannot be any higher than other policies. So that's the disadvantage of financial policy. Right, and and currently the financial policy goes in the direction of lower interest rates anyway, at least in, in many countries. So no matter what the <laughs> interest rates, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can have a zero lower bond. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> but they are minus. That, <laughs> uh, I think Germany financial costs some, need to be yeah. higher than yeah. zero. If yeah. we don't have that zero bond, uh, uh, the financial policy can also be very high than other policies. Okay, I don't see any any other questions here, but I have a question I think for Rui um, for his paper. And the question is, how about looking at some exogenous uh, shocks which trigger the change in rules of ESG mandatory disclosure? Yeah, that's a uh, very interesting question. Um, so actually we look at uh, according to our findings, I mean, we just uh, try to collect those mandatory disclosure policy country by, by country. So for, I mean, in all the countries, I would say all the countries, so there is no such kind of exogenous shocks, like I mentioned. So it's pretty hard to push such a strong signal or this policy to mandate all the firms or maybe part of the firms to disclose the information. So most of countries, they will just uh, try to enforce those kind of mandatory disclosure gradually, either starting from the voluntary or starting from some kind of proportion of the firm. For example, I only require the state-owned firms or maybe the top 100 list of firms to disclose those, those information. Because, you know, it's pretty hard to, I mean, uh, to my knowledge, there's no such kind of ignore shocks. But if we can find, or if you, I mean, if, uh, uh, if you know the ignore shocks, I would be very happy to know that because that will help us to solve the, the possible indoor problem. That would be a very fantastic setting we are chasing for. But unfortunately, so far we haven't found it. Thank okay. you for the question. Very Thanks a lot. I don't see the name of the, of the person who asked the mm -hmm. question, but they know your contacts probably and they yeah. can, can send you an email. I have another one for, for, for Don Young. Um, did you check how sensitive the results are to different types of financial frictions? The working capital requirement is a very specific one and could, uh, I could imagine that results differ if you use other types of constraints. You have to unmute. Dong Yang, you have to unmute first. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. So this is a very good point. And uh, uh, yes, in this paper, I only introduced one kind of financial constraint, that is the so-called working capital constraint. And uh, uh, actually, if I change the parameter of the constraint, the strength of the constraint, the result will not change a lot. But yes, as you mentioned, if I change the constraint to other type, the result could vary. And yes, this is a very good point. I should try to introduce other financial constraint and see if my result will change a lot. Yeah, thank you for this very good point. Thanks a lot. I don't see any other questions here anymore, but if someone from the, on the presenters want to ask a question, let me know as well. I think you can just uh, ask, ask it if you unmute yourself. I have a question for, for Stephanie. So with regard to stakeholders, so what do you think, what is the role of stakeholders in, in processes like the, like coming up with this EU regulation? Uh, sorry, um, can you can you repeat? Um, because I was trying to put the yeah. video and I'm, I'm yeah. blocked. So yeah, yeah. Uh, can you what, Yes, I can ask it again. So, what do you think? What is the role of stakeholders in in in, in such processes? On the one hand, of course, you have this group that, that, that 
deliberates, but then there's a lot of external influences and stakeholders as well that probably try to influence the, the decision. So did you find? Yeah, so, yeah. so basically, well, it's also how the European Commission use high level expert groups. So they kind of, uh, they kind of isolate them, they make them independent and they try what we call protecting collective will formation. But that doesn't mean that they don't interact with the other. For example, uh, so there was 29 members of the, the high level expert group, including members and observer. But when they had this uh, meeting, sorry, uh, when they had the, the plenary session in the room, you will have 60 people because you will have the people from the EC European Commission, some, some external people. So, and, um, and all the work also about uh, promoting public outreach was to, to go to, pe to talk to people, to do public consultation, uh, to have a debate uh, in the European uh, Commission realm. To, to do that. So after the question with the, and especially if you are into the deliberative democracy uh, ideals, uh, which is, okay, but what about the, the average citizen? Because in these groups, you don't have the average citizen. You have people who have a reasonable knowledge about sustainable finance. Also some NGO people could have been kind of the closest from an average person and, and their knowledge about systemal finance. So, so there is that question about, yeah, the, the possibility to include everybody uh, in this type of process and, and how do you do that? And I think it's a big question because I guess finance and financial regulation doesn't have necessarily a very good uh, reputation for some people. Uh, some uh, some some citizens so so there is really yeah something there so thank you for the question about how you get uh, people to actually understand what finance could do positively for matters like climate change that they may care of but they don't connect that they will think if I eat, uh, I stop to eat meat, uh, it's fine. But they don't think if I look at what, how I invest my savings, uh, what's going to happen. And there we have a huge, uh, huge uh, problem and challenge to deal with because we are really not there yet. So, um, yeah, but I think it's coming progressively to try to get citizens more, uh, an inclusive uh, range of stakeholders into this type of uh, process. Thank you. And I think we have formed five more minutes. And then um, as the topic of this session is green finance policy and regulators, maybe, maybe the presenters can let us know the one idea or the one proposal they have to, to create green finance policies that are as good as possible. So based on, on your research, what would you say uh, is, is, is a good way to, to create a, a a good green finance policy. So if, if I don't know, governments would ask you, what would you uh, advise them? Mm. So I can start. So for me, I think based on that research we did, I think because financial regulation is really about efficiency and stability. And uh, there is really, I think, to be able to tackle the question of climate change and all the other issues that are going to challenge us in the next decade, there was the question of about social justice and uh, the social side, because uh, uh, sustainability is not only about environmental aspects, it's also about social aspects. And we had a keynote was talking about South Africa uh, earlier and the fact that it's a country where it's the, the biggest, the population is very young and they are, they are very high level of unemployment. So we are going to have to deal with um, like very challenging social aspects. So for me, I think it's really thinking inclusively uh, and reflexively about uh, what we want to put in financial regulation to get to a world who cares about the environment, but uh, there is bigger, there is a bigger picture to the green um, policy aspects. I think. Thank you, Rui. You okay. Idea. Yeah. So according to uh, according to my paper, 
definitely I will focus on the information disclosure. In our paper, we found that uh, there's a, a, a big heterogeneity across the mandatory ESG disclosure policies. That means in a different country, they are facing a different problem. Some countries have uh, maybe have a priority to reduce the carbon emission, but some countries maybe just reduce the pollution. For some emerging countries, maybe they pay more attention to the growth of economy and they don't have actual resources to focus on some environmental problem. So for since for different countries, they have different scenarios. So according to our studies, so it's, it seems like, so uh, there is no universal framework about the mandatory disclosure that fit into all countries. So first the countries should start from their, their needs or start from their, uh, their long-term strategy or long-term goals to try to green their economy. And also regarding to the typical policies, uh, so we found that in our study, we found that in some countries, they only just mandate the firm to disclose the information without providing some kind of guidance or maybe some kind of framework. Or in some country, they only have very loose guidelines. That means you can just follow either the GRI or whatever. So we found that in those countries, the disclosure quality is not, I mean, uh, the firms will just comply with those kind of policies superficially. So if you ask me to disclose, I will disclose, okay? So, but the information quality is pretty low. So that's why uh, in our study, we found that although the numbers of the EIG reports increased significantly after adopting those kind of policy, but the quality, it depends. In some countries, the quality increase. And for certain type of firms, the quality will increase after the mandatory disclosure policies. But in some other countries, or for some type of firms, they only superficially comply with the policy. So this will just uh, give some, I mean, I won't say warnings, maybe some kind of uh, policy implication for the policymaker. When you just um, try to construct or propose those kind of mandatory yes, this uh, of policy, it's better to just uh, give more rigorous about uh, the rigorous guidelines or maybe some kind of frameworks to the firm. Because some firms, they even themselves will confuse about what's the ESG, what kind of information should I uh, disclose or should I report? So if they can provide some kind of guidelines or framework, so this will just, uh, first they will help the firm to disclose the information. And secondly, it will help the government or the policy makers to collect the, universe, the standardized ESG information. Because if you don't have the guideline, so the ESG is a very, very broad concept. So they can disclose lo lots of things. So that will be the, I mean, my suggestions for the po uh, policy makers when they make those kind of policies regarding to yet disclosure. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dong Yang. Any idea? Uh, I'm thinking that uh, uh, before carrying out any so-called green financial policy, the policymaker need to be clear what is the ultimate purpose of that kind of policy. For example, in China and uh, continental Europe, the original purpose of the so-called green financial policy is very different. China is wanting to green the economy, they want to help the growth of the green sector. But for Europe, the policymaker want to prevent the uh, so-called climate risk. So the original purpose of the policies are different. So when carrying out the policies, the policymaker need to first think what kind of the uh, result they want. For example, in my paper, I only introduced uh, the growth of the green sector and the uh, decrease of the non-green sector. I didn't introduce any uh, risk or uncertainty into this paper. So if we want to analyze the risk, the climate risk, we need to also introduce the consideration of uncertainty in the making of policies. So that's my thinking. Thank you. Thanks, I think there were really interesting insight at the end of the session and uh, I think uh, we are exactly in time. So thanks again, Stephanie, Dong Yang and uh, Rui for these, uh, for these interesting presentations and the, and the discussion. And I think uh, with that, we can finish the, the session, have a nice rest of the day or evening, wherever, wherever you are. Thanks, and thanks thank a lot you. for sharing. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks thank a you. lot. Thank you for joining. Bye. 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 Bye.